Hello everyone, I hope this video finds you well. Today, on the back of Barcelona's recent victory at Valencia, I want us to do something a little bit different and hone in on a very specific part of this football team. And that's how it operates in the final third. It's an area that has been inconsistent for Barca, particularly with the wingers and with some of the decision making. It was the case again against Valencia, so it felt like a good time to go a little bit deeper and not just talk about what isn't working, but what exactly the players should be looking to do differently. So I hope you enjoy it. Of course, leave a like if you do, and let's get on with it. So I've talked a lot this season about Barca's build-up principles and different tactics in possession, and I've sort of glossed over what happens at the end of their attacks, the all-important final action. So today I want to focus on that. But for the sake of context against Valencia and in the previous game against Bayern Munich actually, Barca were up against a medium to high line where if you breach the initial press, there's a lot of space to be exploited in the final third. And we're looking for good decision making and quality to turn this space into actual goal scoring chances. To illustrate what a team wants to achieve in these situations, I'm going to lean a bit on the expected threat model, which was created by Karen Singh. It uses event data from the Premier League to calculate the likelihood of a goal coming in the next five actions from any given position on the field. So the more green the zone on this grid, the more likely a goal is to come from this position in the next five actions. And it's very much common sense, but the more central and the closer to the goal we are, the more threatening a position is. You'll also notice that the byline here is especially threatening, but that's a bit of an anomaly that I'm going to touch on later. For now, just assume that once we've unlocked space, we simply want to get close to the goal and central. So that's our first universal rule of decision making. And coming back to Barcelona, it's one that players do break quite often. So here in this Valencia game, Balde does what Balde does best and drives through the middle of the pitch. But when he gets here to the critical moment where he could find Lewandowski with a direct pass, he deviates and takes a touch in this direction, away from goal, and the attack breaks down. The same went for Frankie de Jong here, who is fed between the lines by Pedri, and bearing down on goal, he takes a touch again in the opposite direction. So by the time he shoots, there are bodies back and it's a more difficult execution. Pedri is also guilty of it here. He has the opportunity to make a threatening central pass, but no, he takes a touch on the outside. And it's very much common sense why these are bad decisions. Not only are you moving away from the goal, but you're denying yourself a threatening pass into your centre forward. And that's one of the reasons that Lewandowski doesn't get as many chances as he probably could have. Barca just aren't ruthless enough with these final passes. And when they are like here, when Pedri feeds Ansu Fati with a direct pass towards goal, Ansu can't finish. You'll notice though that these situations are arising when the attack is already quite centralised. So when players have broken between the lines and are running at the defence. This in most games is actually quite rare. And much more typically, opponents are going to prioritise locking down these areas and leaving the space out wide. That's why teams that use positional play like Barcelona, Man City and Arsenal put a lot of emphasis on attacking the flanks. The question is though, how do you turn space in those wide areas into a greater threat in the middle? And sometimes the problem for Barca is that they don't even try. So rather than working the ball into a more threatening central position, players are hitting the box immediately from out wide. And the reality is, based on the data and on the results, you're unlikely to score goals by doing that. Of course, it is possible. Barcelona, as well as every team in the world, have and will continue to score from wide crosses. But if we're talking about optimal decision making, for a team that has the lion's share of possession in most games, we can do better than this. And that's what we're going to explore in the next section. How do we access better central zones by using wingers and dribbling? So we see Barcelona get into this position quite often, moving the ball from left to right to open up a winger in space. And just like we've discussed, from here we want to be moving from outside to in as much as possible. And our friend Dembele here gives us some perfect examples, both of what to do and what not to do. Even before they receive the ball, the winger has some decisions to make. The first of which is, what are you going to do with your first touch? And most of the time, you want to keep the ball close to your body, because that gives you the most options of what to do next. If your first touch is too far out of your feet and pushing the ball in a certain direction, you're already limiting your options. And if there's a defender close by, it's very easy to be read and you risk the chance of them diving in and winning the ball. This is actually a consistent problem for Dembele, 
whose first touch often is heavy, committing him to an immediate forward action, and he ends up losing the ball too much because of that. So your first touch is very important. Second thing we want to look at with dribbling is the angle of your approach to the defender. You kind of want your body to be in line with the ball and the man, not offset too much. By keeping the ball close to the midline, you keep your options open, and here it allows Dembele to keep the defender guessing. Will he cut inside or make the pass to Roberto on the outside? It's very difficult to read. On the other hand, if you're at too much of an angle like Rafinha here, there's really no way he can come back inside because the defender will be so much closer to the ball. So he's forcing himself to go on the outside. The defender knows that and reads it easily. Another good example here from Dembele, as he puts both of these principles together, he's isolated 1v1 versus the fullback, but his first touch is close to him, giving him options. And he uses this to accelerate and start his run. He then gets his angle correct against the defender, goes out to in, and because he's more central, he can pick this more direct pass that we talked about in the first section towards the goal and into your centre forward. Perfect decision making and perfect technique to execute it. All of this is just as relevant when you're working a shooting position as when you're creating from deeper. So Ansu Fati, who's often at the end of attacks rather than the beginning, against Valencia tended to take his first touch on the outside pushing the ball towards goal immediately. And there's nothing wrong with this as long as you're effective enough on your left foot at these angles. One player that comes to mind who's very good at this and is very proactive with his first touch is Vinicius. But he's absolutely nailed scoring from these positions. And by the evidence in this game, Ansu Fati hasn't yet. If he's going to keep doing this, he'll need to work on this specific finish. For most right-footed players, even this close to goal, you want to give yourself the option of cutting inside even at the last moment. So in a similar position against Villarreal, Lewandowski's first touch is close to him. He's in a line with the ball and the marker, and he puts the defender in a state of reaction. He doesn't know which way he's going to go. That means he can work the ball onto his favourite right foot and scores a fantastic goal. In all of these dribbling examples, I'm putting the emphasis on going out to in. And the reason for that is, in my opinion, they're more directly threatening than actions that take you away from the goal and towards the byline. This somewhat contradicts that XT model, which claims that the byline is more often a dangerous zone than outside of the box. And while I agree that the byline is very dangerous, actually I would say that a dribble into that zone is less threatening than a pass into it. And that's because when you're dribbling, you can only access the space as quickly as the player on the ball can run. And that gives a chance for the defender to retreat, cutting out the most important area, which is right in front of the goal. You'll also note that in this position, because you have to cut the ball backwards, the defender can see both the crosser and the man he's marking, making it easier to judge angles and intercept. This changes quite considerably when you're making a pass into this space, which happened in the Villarreal game, as Alva runs in behind. The pace on the ball means the defender hasn't been able to retreat, and you unlock that very threatening zone in front of goal, which should be impossible to miss from. This situation also gives the centre forward a big advantage because if they're smart enough, they can start well ahead of the defender without being caught offside. So that's why a pass down the line, in my opinion, is more effective than a dribble. And if you are just dribbling, I would say it's more beneficial to cut inside most often rather than try and head outside for the byline. I wanted to explain all of this to show the complexity that goes into every quote unquote good or bad decision from the first touch to the decision to dribble or pass, the angle approach to the defender, making the right call on going inside or outside, it all requires really high footballing IQ. It's not enough just to have the speed or technique or dexterity, you've got to understand the implications of every decision you're making. Because if you don't, you're going to get this wrong more often than you get it right. That's what, in my opinion, separates a good forward from a truly elite one. And that's what we're seeing at the moment from Barca's forwards, particularly Dembele, who attempts these actions so often, but invariably gets at least one of these steps wrong, and it's what makes him so frustrating. But now let's broaden the conversation out a bit from just the wingers, and talk about delivering the final pass, because ultimately that can come from anywhere, and it's an entirely different type of decision making. Like I've just alluded to, passes are generally more effective than dribbles at exploiting space. A pass can reach space more quickly than a run can, and you can beat multiple players with them, whereas with dribbles, you're usually taking out one player at a time. That's where, for players like Dembele, small details like the quality of your first touch is so important, 
It would allow him to better react to situations and be more patient with his ball usage rather than constantly setting off on difficult dribbles. Because when he calms down and looks to do that, he's pretty good at executing the final pass. One of the examples we briefly looked at already is Pep Guardiola's favourite, the diagonal pass into the half space. For Barca, these runs happen quite often, they've certainly been coached, but they should probably be exploited more. And there's not much to analyse here because it's purely about quality of delivery. So Ansu runs into the space instead of passing to Lewandowski, Dembele's pass is intercepted on this occasion, and here Pedri actually receives the pass but he takes an extra touch which allows the defender to block the ball across. It did come together in this example, but Ferran misses that impossible to miss open goal. What makes these passes so dangerous is that not only are they moving the ball more central, out to in, but crucially the defender can't see both the passer and the runner at the same time and that makes them much harder to defend than a horizontal cross from out wide. Though it's a different type of pass, Rafinha's assist to Lewandowski is a perfect example of this principle. You can't look at the passer and the runner behind you at the same time, making it really hard to defend. Rafinha is extremely good at making this specific pass, and Barca should probably use it more often, so long as the timing is right, because admittedly Rafinha can do this when he's much too wide, or when the runners aren't really there, but positioned a lot more centrally with Lewandowski at the back post, this was the perfect timing. And that brings me to my final point, which is about timing. Because the key to Barca's or any team's success in the final third is exactly that. So to wrap all of this neatly together, I need to make this final little section about Pedri. There were two occasions against Valencia where Pedri had the ball on the left, and could have fed it into Ferran Torres who was making a run down the line. Yes, this would have been a pass into space, but away from the direction of goal. So instead, Pedri cuts inside and plays on the first occasion this through ball to put Gabi one versus one, and on the second occasion, this pre-assist to the Rafinha chance we just looked at, who, because the build-up has been delayed, has been able to drift into a more central position. And it's this ability of Pedri's to delay his decision making turning down a promising pass in order to find an even better one that transforms a final third entry into a real chance. And out of all of Barca's forwards, it's only Pedri and possibly Lewandowski that have this ability innately. In Spanish, they call it la pausa, and without it, choosing not just a good option, but the best option in the final third becomes quite unlikely. This lack of pausa is the root cause of Barca's final third woes, and to what extent it can be coached is debatable, Dembele knows he can beat a man 1v1, he can go inside or outside, and he can deliver a dangerous pass from almost everywhere. But can he appropriately pick his moments so he's not just performing a threatening action, but the most threatening action? And that's definitely still up in the air. So the next time you see an attack breakdown in the final third, you can ask yourself, was the action going towards the direction of goal? Was the correct decision made to pass or dribble? Was it executed properly? And most importantly, was there a more threatening option on elsewhere? So I hope this video has gone some way to explaining what makes good decision making and how Barca's forwards could improve in the final third. This actually wraps up our October video schedule. I've analysed every single Barcelona game this month and from now on I'll be picking and choosing which games I cover. The actual quantity of content shouldn't change, so let me know what other type of content you'd like to see. Once again, I really hope you enjoyed, and I also hope you enjoy the rest of your day. So, until next time, take care.